It gives me a great honor to introduce Professor Henderson to give his keynote lecture on Lysistrata Through the Ages. Thank you, Dean Meraki. And uh, thanks to all of you, my hosts, uh, for this invitation uh, to speak at, at the uh, festivities um, on Lysistrata Lys uh, this week. Um, it's a wonderful evening, a beautiful evening late in the week, big game coming up on which good luck to you all. Um, and yet, I'm very touched that you came to, to this keynote. Um, and I hope it's not Coles to Newcastle or Owls to Athens after the rich uh, seminars and discussions that you've been having. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I thought that my part in this year's uh, symposium uh, on a play that's delighted and fascinated me through the years is actually to talk about it through the years. And uh, since this is a humanities um, sort of gathering of the clans of the humanities to talk about their particular take on the play that I would attempt something that I haven't done before, uh, which is to put the play, as far as I know, into uh, context in this era and that era and that culture and, and that culture. Um, I've loved this play. I've taught it. I've edited it. I've interpreted it. I've translated it three times for various uh, purposes. When I was a penniless young professor, Lysistrata paid for my travels in Europe to collate its eight surviving manuscripts from England to Denmark to Holland to Germany to Italy. And more recently, I was even a performer when a student production invited me to play the magistrate when I was dean. <laughs> it would surely compromise my dignitas, but I accepted. Um, the director told the women that when they dressed me as a woman, they would not put lipstick on the dean. But of course, this order was disregarded. And uh, so, in the event, my protests had a ring of authenticity to them. In the usual contemporary fashion, the, the play that I was in had uh, been adapted to reflect current issues. In this case, issues in the college. Our current national wars were kind of put to the side because they didn't seem the right sort of wars to protest in the manner of Lysistrata, or even to protest at all. So the sexual and the um, complaints about the dean and the generations and so forth came to the fore. Uh, the dean was going to get criticism in any case, so I thought it would be more fun if the actual dean were right there instead of having a student play the dean. Um, and it's now actually a tradition for the dean to appear in one of these Aristophanes performances. My successor was persuaded to do this herself. Um, <clears throat> and after all, uh, the Athenian democracy of the 5th century BC believed that a community whose authorities can be frankly teased and criticized and are expected to be good sports about it and being laughed at was the worst fate for a classical Greek. That is a stronger and more confident community than one whose citizens are not entirely free to speak their minds. Throughout history, the latter kind of community, the one that isn't so free to speak out, has always outnumbered the former kind. Different communities have different ideas about what teasing and criticism is acceptable, and there is never any unanimity even within a community uh, about what is acceptable humor. And I would just call to mind remarks of Rush Limbaugh recently. Some people think that's very funny. Some people think that's outrageous. Uh, so it all depends if you're dealing with edgy humor about real life. Um, uh, a, a poet and audience always have to negotiate what's, uh, what's funny and what isn't. And it's always a little bit edgy. In classical Athens, too, although these festivals seem to have been privileged areas uh, where um, some very direct and rough humor and comedy could be created. Um, even in classical Athens, some considered the notion of a confident community, that is, of a democratic, self-governing community, to be a bad thing. Rule by the co lowest common denominator, um, uncontrolled public expression uh, that might undermine uh, uh, solidarity and citizen values and so forth. Uh, Many complained that the theater and theatrical humor had a negative effect on civic order and morale. It wasn't good for people. Plato, for instance, uh, thought that drama probably should be banned from the ideal community. 
and most mythology as well. One thing that's very rare is the opportunity to see how a single topical comedy is received by many different communities over a long span of time. Most examples of the genre don't survive very long, even in their original community. In this respect, Lysistrata is virtually unique. It's been preserved for 2,423 years. It's been made available in all Western languages and several Eastern ones. It's still regularly performed, and it still has the power to speak to its audience across time and space. For the past 150 years especially, it has seen countless revivals and inspired films, plays, operas, oratorios, songs, comic strips, and various spontaneous happenings. In light of the play's remarkable adaptability, I think it's interesting to look at its reception uh, in various countries, including Greece, since its first performance in Athens in 411 BC. And this is a pretty selective look, again, um, and this is an area that I'd recommend for some research because uh, there hasn't really been much research on the reception of Aristophanes. The, the only full treatment was in 1925, and that was very unfull, and there's been a recent book by Martin Holtermann about the reception of Aristophanes in Germany, which is very interesting, but other than that, it's pretty unknown. So I've, I've uh, kind of picked around and picked some examples of various eras, and I'll go through that, but I'll start with the original performance. Uh, <clears throat> we don't know much about the original performance. We do know a few things. In the winter of 411, Around this time of year, actually, uh, several thousand Athenians took their seats in the outdoor amphitheater at the foot of the Acropolis to see Lysistrata, new comedy of Aristophanes. The occasion was the annual Lanaya Festival, wine press festival in honor of Dionysus, which featured a national competition for prizes in comedy and tragedy, although comedy was the more important genre at this festival. As was the case also in the spring Dionysia festival, the audience was uniquely inclusive of the population in that not only male citizens, but every category of Athenian could attend. And this was the only time of the year in which uh, public gatherings uh, could include uh, all types of the population, men, women, children, slaves. But unlike the Dionysia, the Lanaya was attended by no foreigners. So it was especially suitable for dramas about parochial issues. In the comic competition were five comedies, each one performed by an amateur cast of 29 young men recruited for the occasion. 24 chorus men who would sing and dance in the orchestra and four actors who would play all the roles in the given play. Men playing females was the rule. This wasn't a drag show, but a performance convention. Female characters were assumed to be female. Fairly straightforward since all the performers wore masks and performed in this large amphitheater setting. As was traditional in the theatrical festivals, comic characters were free, in fact, in fact expected to behave and to use language, including obscenity, in ways that would not be allowed on any other public occasion, including nudity, violence, personal insult and abuse, and the frank and out, occasionally outrageous expression of opinion on divisive issues of the day. The director was usually the poet, but for Lysistrata, he was Callistratus, a friend of Aristophanes who had produced several of Aristophanes' plays over the years, including his debut 16 years earlier, as well as two very edgy comedies that had provoked the popular leader, Cleon, to prosecute Aristophanes unsuccessfully, first for treason and then for libel, and possibly also for false enrollment as a citizen. Perhaps Callistratus as director and the Linnea as the venue led some spectators, spectators to expect that the play would engage politically. And though this couldn't be counted on, since relatively few comedies were truly political, um, and Aristophanes had not written a political comedy in 10 years, so it wasn't clear what was going to happen at this festival. Aristophanes had not written a comedy for 10 years um, because the situation really wasn't ripe for him at the moment. Uh, comic poets are sometimes thought to have had a license to abuse and that anyone was fair game for ridicule and criticism, uh, 
Uh, so Aristophanes, as a good satirical poet, would exercise this option every year. Um, but actually, political mockery in, in old comedy and political engagement uh, was consistently biased. Virtually all of the political targets were Democrats in the populist mold of Pericles and his successors, the demagogues who emerged after Pericles' death in 429. While rightist figures are almost entirely spared and occasionally even defended, and this bias persists even when rightists were ascendant. At the ideological and policy level, too, the political comic poets consistently espouse the social, moral, cultural, and political sentiments of elite conservatives. They decry full popular sov sovereignty as a gullible majority intent on soaking the rich and empowering scoundrels, and the operation of the council, the assembly, and the courts. They criticize the poor as a class, but never the wealthy avoid the always live issue of oligarchy while instead ridiculing the populist bogey of elite tyranny, and they attack the prosecution of the Peloponnesian War when, but only when, it either exposed the Attic countryside and thus the landowners to enemy devastation or bolstered the authority of popular leaders like Cleon. Like Thucydides, the comic poets held that the democracy needed but the people tended not to choose the best as its leaders, except that comedy did not include Pericles in the category of best. So the likeliest explanation of Aristophanes' political silence following the Peace of Nicias in 421 is that his sort of people and policies were now ascendant. But the political situation in Athens in 411 had changed, had become ripe for Aristophanes to weigh in again, the political situation was far more volatile after the defeat of the Sicilian expedition, which you've all, you all know about. Um, the defeat of the expedition um, created a volatile and dangerous political situation at Athens. And in fact, the political situation was more sensitive than it had been in any time for 50 years since the democratic revolution itself. Democracy was in fact under, under challenge the Athenians had suffered hor horrible losses in the Sicilian expedition. Their allies had begun to desert them. The enemy was once again occupying the countryside. Their treasury was bare. For elite conservatives, this was proof of what they had suspected all along. Democracy was mob rule, incapable of self-discipline or intelligent decision-making, and therefore doomed to fail unless power was returned to the best people. Even Democrats were feeling demoralized. They had recently agreed to surrender some of the people's power to a board of 10 elite pro-counselors, these magistrates, one of whom is the unsympathetic character in Lysistrata. The Democratic majority was still eager to prosecute the war, however, while those leaning to oligarchy, especially the landowning elite and the former aristocracy, were exploring a negotiated peace on their own. Within a few months of the play's performance, these cross-purposes would violently collide. There would be a campaign of disinformation and terror organized by right-wing clubs, selective assassination of democratic leaders, and the installation of an oligarchic government. Even for those who suspected that Lysistrata would be topical, the play must have come as a surprise. Its title did not suggest that it would be a play about war and politics, understandable in such a dangerously polarized atmosphere, but a play only about women. It must also have come as a surprise, and for some a shock, that the play featured not just any women, but citizen wives. This was apparently unprecedented. Though democratic, Athens was among the least liberal states in Greece with respect to gender, and strong social protocols protected the propriety and respectability of citizen women, not only in topical comedy, but even in tragedy, where all the characters were figures from the Bronze Age and mostly non-Athenian. But sure enough, Lysistrata had a citizen heroine and was about war and politics, urging a negotiated end to the war abroad and at home a reconciliation between political and generational factions. A heroine was a brilliant choice, a stakeholder who nevertheless stood above and outside the partisan fray who was fictional, but portrayed as a woman of irreproachable dignity and wisdom, indeed larger than life, 
being assimilated to the city goddess Athena and her real-life priestess Lysimache. Think maybe the Statue of Liberty plus Oprah Winfrey. Um, women as a collective could represent what men and the Greek states at war were not. Unified, solidary, unchanging, traditional, nurturing, life-creating, life-affirming. To choose love, not war, affirmed all that was good and productive in the national experience. The play was not exactly pacifist, for it's not all war, but this particular war that is wrong. Um, Lysistrata drops that she wouldn't mind everybody fighting uh, barbarians in the future, but still there's a very strong anti-war feel to the play. Uh, war is not the best way uh, to spend one's life. Nor was the play a feminist play, exactly, even though the women do complain that the men don't give them enough credit. The women aren't seeking to change the status quo, let alone liberate themselves from female roles. On the contrary, they celebrate their female roles and accuse the men of betraying the contract. You men are not upholding the fundamental social value, uh, which is the household, which is the relationship of families. That's the ultimate thing. You've betrayed it. We would not have come out of our houses. We would not have done all this if you hadn't let your side of the bargain down. And uh, we will go back and be great wives as soon as you agree to stop this madness. Uh, so they aim in the play only to force men to listen to good sense on this one issue. Um, but the play leaves a strong sense anyway of a utopian view of life uh, in which men and women are, are friends and complementary uh, and life can be uh, devoted to, to love and not war. Lysistrata was a new twist on Aristophanes' standard message. Conservative, oligarchy light, demo but democracy is doable. Um, but it should choose as leaders the best people and not selfish and corrupt populists. That's the undercurrent. The play's women are characterized as members of the elite strata of society. The old men of the chorus are typical Democrats. The young warriors are kept carefully apolitical in the play. The women's conspiracy sort of resembles oligarchic plots and initiatives, uh, which were known to be underway at the time. And their arguments are virtually identical to those that the actual oligarchs were currently making in favor of a negotiated peace. At the time of the Linnea, the resemblance could still be amusing, since few people would yet consider an actual coup d'etat very likely. In the event, these arguments were not successful when the oligarchic regime had its chance to use them. The oligarchs were tossed out in a democratic counter coup, and the war continued. It's noteworthy that in the play, Lysistrata's arguments aren't actually decisive. The men negotiate in order to reclaim their wives, not because they agree with what Lysistrata says. So the play contains a frontal co uh, confrontation with, with the deepest issues of the day, uh, and yet it still maintains a comic distance from those. As it turned out, the radical democracy of 5th century Athens did not long survive the war whose loss in 404 was indeed exhibit A for detractors. Nor did old comedy long survive. Later in antiquity, with its more authoritarian regimes, old comedy was remembered for its outspokenness as a hallmark of democracy, a good or bad thing, depending on your view of democracy. For sympathizers, old comedy exemplified an amazing degree of free speech, and moralists liked what they saw as comedy's function as public castigator of vice. For detractors, old comedy exemplified the vulgarity and insolence of common people, further evidence that democracy had been a bad idea. <clears throat> as for Lysistrata, there's no evidence that it ever had a second performance in antiquity, or that it was much read, except as a source for linguistic usage and antiquarian information. It contains very few explicit political references. Very few names are named because of the sensitivity of the era. And so um, that alone made it less interest to ancient historians. And also war wasn't the same kind of issue after 404. Since it was no longer citizens who did the fighting, but professional armies, mostly mercenaries. <clears throat> 
changing the status of women was at most a, re a theoretical issue for philosophers. And for subsequent cultures, the play's sex and obscenity were usually stumbling blocks for readers and performers alike. Like women at the Thesmophoria, the other women's play that Aristophanes wrote in 411, this was the one where women protested their portrayal in Euripides' tragedies. Lysistrata survived antiquity, but only barely. Only one manuscript has the complete text, and this manuscript was not discovered in time for the first printed edition of Aristophanes in 1498. Women at the Thesmophoria and Lysistrata were finally published together in 1516 with the disclaimer that if the reader finds something offensive in these two comedies, it is because everything that has been printed is as it stood in the Greek original, without changes. A disclaimer that carried on an ancient tradition in the new medium of printing that would vastly expand the readership that would assure this, the, the play survives. And uh, we have to thank the uh, scribes over the many centuries of copying these works um, for not changing them even though there was material in Lysistrata that would offend the, the people that copied them for centuries. Um, they copied them intact, and they kept them intact. Um, and so that tradition was continued. In the early 16th century, few Europeans could read ancient Greek. Erasmus was, un was unusual, and he's among the earliest to notice Lysistrata in casual remarks about women's emancipation but it wasn't long before Lysistrata was translated into Latin and gradually into vernaculars, usually, though not inevitably, in censored versions. Latin was acceptable for complete and literal translation, vernaculars not. And the hoi polloi, of course, were not to be trusted with such material. The general pattern of reception outside scholarly contexts where the original or a Latin translation was read is that Lysistrata tends to be rediscovered in times of revolutionary change or where popular theater is emerging, or sometimes simply as an excuse for obscenity, often under the cover of classical prestige. At all periods before modern times, the Aristophanic play best known and the safest to know, or, or even produce, was the moralistic Plutus, or wealth. At the other end of the spectrum was Lysistrata. Its take on gender roles aside, it was considered simply too outrageous and obscene to be translated straight or even complete. And so unexpurgated translations of Aristophanes have been very rare until fairly recently. And Lysistrata was often omitted entirely. An addition by Mitchell uh, in 1813 admitted it, and Mitchell explains in his introduction, because the plot turns on a proposal so gross that we shall not insult our readers with it. <laughs> Still, there were early encounters, mainly through the medium of the printing press rather than performance, which could only be done through adaptations that could work around the play's gross proposal. Beaumont and Fletcher, active during the reign of James I, 1603 to 1625, wrote a women's prize, or the Tamer Tamed, with English names and settings that was modeled on Lysistrata and has some features in common with Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, and this uh, women's prize was about a revolt of wives unhappy with male prerogatives and arrogance in general, who refused sex to their husbands, and in the case of the character Livia, refused marriage altogether until the men moderate their ways. This adaptation encountered some resistance in the Jacobean era, but Aristophanes attracted more interest in the freer Restoration era beginning in the mid-1600s, this is a period of interregnum and restoration. For example, Edward Howard's comedy of 1669, The Six Days Adventure, where men withheld sex from uh, when women came to power um, and enable themselves to court men. And this is a twist we'll see later. Um, many adaptations of Lysistrata have the men going on strike. Um, because women going on strike is just too unthinkable for the time, I guess. Um, and it also has to do with which cultures consider women to have sexual drives and which don't. Um, our country culture uh, defines gender roles in, in the way that men are supposed to be the ones that have the higher desire for, for women. 
um, the classical Greeks and most of history, I think, is the other way around. Women are the ones that are the, the hornier gen, uh, gender, and men are the ones that are pursued. Um, so in, in Howard's comedy, um, the men withhold sex uh, when the women come to power and enable themselves to court men. Um, <clears throat> Interest continued into the time of Henry Fielding in the mid-1700s in England, but then ended until the turn of the 20th century, when Lysistrata attracted notice in light of feminist and women's emancipation movements. It served as a classical forebearer, both for revolutionaries and for reactionaries, especially in Germany, where Aristophanes' women's plays were more centrally adapted for political purposes than in the Anglophone world and also more generally as a charter text for theatrical modernism. And it's fascinating to see how Lysistrata is a, adapted in various ways in the various cultures. Um, Lysistrata was a big modernist uh, hit in 1908 in Berlin uh, with Max Reinhardt's production, um, but this would have gone over, this would have been totally mysterious in, in London or New York at the time. So we can step back and look at responses to Aristophanes in terms of cultural and intellectual movements of the Enlightenment and its aftermath. Um, Aristophanes being claimed both by revolutionaries and reactionaries, elites and proletariat, depending on what aspects they found congenial to their causes. Um, Lysistrata especially was a kind of Rorschach test, a kaleidoscope that characterizes scholarly approaches as well. Uh, <clears throat> In Romantic Hellenism, uh, in the, at the end of the 18th century up to the revolutions of 1848, uh, for instance, Schlegel, uh, for, for Schlegel, Aristophanes exemplif exemplified freedom and joy, comedy being the most democratic of art forms, a popular genre with emancipatory potential. Uh, though people should steer clear of its sex and obscenity, which had been merely a concession to the rabble, the lower orders, um, <clears throat> who should rather have been elevated, but at least were properly ridiculed and castigated. Aristophanes was central to the effort to recover ancient interest in the experience of democracy and individual subjectivity, the relationship between art and society. Meanwhile, monarchists and aristocrats took a dim view of this effort. For them, Aristophanes was less a castigator of the vices and shortcomings of democracy, um, for example, popular leaders like Cleon, than evidence of its intrinsic degeneracy. In England, 19th century historians uh, reflect a turn to political liberalism, which refocused Aristophanic interpretation in different directions. Uh, Aristophanes exemplified festive license, a time out of time, a social safety valve, and a harmless fun fest, or a free spirit unconstrained by the censures of Christianity who rejoiced in sexuality, both hetero and homo, in a kind of innocent way. Or he was an artist who also engaged with politics, but more in a utopian than a political spirit. Not a serious artist, but a humorist who could incorporate the serious. Or he was a moral or patriotic poet who cherished his country's glorious past and tried to counteract its present failings. And you can all see this in, in Lysistrata in the generations, where the old men of the play are patriots from the glorious days of the Persian Wars, uh, an implicit contrast to the modern, unsuccessful uh, fighters of the day. Especially for George Grote, Aristophanes ridiculed everything fine that democracy and its worthy champions like Cleon had achieved. Uh, <clears throat> but, even Aristophanes could not derail the success of democracy. Um, <clears throat> in, not in embodying, um, but in challenging democracy, old comedy was evidence of the system's strength. In Germany, scholars like Hegel, in reaction against the more radical pre-revolutionary appropriations of Aristophanes, constructed a conservative Aristophanes who exposed the false subjectivities in a conflict-ridden state either by reinstating a conservative poet who fundamentally supported aristocratic values or by proposing that Aristophanes was a lighthearted and playful entertainer, and so forth and so on. Aristophanes in Germany was ever more appropriated to nationalist and reactionary agendas. 
especially at the time of the Franco-Prussian War, leading up to the German victory and foundation of the German Empire in 1871. So Aristophanes was adopted as a model by opponents of dissident and revolutionary groups, particularly critics of the establishment, who feared the dominance of the state over religious institutions and spiritual values, and above all, social democrats and communists. And here it was especially Aristophanes' assembly women that in, was enlisted to illustrate the absurdity of egalitarian theories. But by the late 19th and early 20th century, the women's plays began to attract the attention of supporters of women's emancipation groups, and thus for the first time gained broad audiences both in support of revolutionaries and in opposition. Um, Aristophanes tends to bifurcate politically, um, but when women are brought into it, the time has to be ripe um, for women to be a political factor. Um, <clears throat> Before then, actual performances of Lysistrata are very rare uh, for reasons well illustrated by Francois Benoit Hoffman's Lysistrata or the Athenian Women of 1802, which was forced to close after only four performances. It was an, an adaptation fused with vaudeville. The lyrics were set to popular songs and operatic arias. Uh, written during the negotiations for the Treaty of Amiens, that focused on the war weariness of wives and included no political issues. It was only very mildly racy, and its satire was quite reserved. For example, the wives' oath of celibacy included a self-curse parodying a standard hymn to John the Baptist. The wives did threaten that if the husband didn't capitulate, the wives might have sex with someone else. But their eagerness for husbands proved that they didn't actually have lovers. This is France, after all. Uh, Napoleon was reportedly shocked by the play's irreverent attitude, not toward sex, but toward the war, for moral reasons. And he, and he thought that the, that, that the whole plot made the, the men look weak. And this was no time um, for uh, showing up men. And, uh, and so Napoleon actually picked up on, a, on a, an aspect of the play that's sometimes lost on modern audiences, that. Aristophanes is portraying the men as being overcome by women in the play. The play itself, uh, Hoffman's play, seems to fudge whether the strike forced the peace treaty or the husbands had vowed celibacy until the enemy was defeated. Uh, but we can't really tell because our printed version of the play um, was authorized only after the banning of the stage version. So uh, it was revised for publication. So we don't actually know what went on in the original performance. By the late, late 19th century, social conditions generally enabled translations and adaptations, if not yet faithful to the original, to be freer. And now, a classical pedigree could serve as a cover for obscenity, or at least raciness, as with late 19th century French productions in the cabaret and light theater mode. And here we see Aristophanes, uh, here we see Lysistrata really in two separate modes, one in the obscene review, um, male mode and one as enlisted by women's emancipation. <clears throat> in the cabaret mode, um, uh, in France anyway, women could play the roles, although the plot was typically converted into mythological burlesque, bedroom farce, hedonistic world of courtesans, and sheer escapist fun, with topical references replaced by in-jokes about Paris and, and, and Parisienne. Uh, <clears throat> for example, the 1892 production by uh, Maurice Donnet, co-founder of the Black Cat, the Chat Noir Cabaret, in which Lysistrata has a lover for whom she competes with a courtesan, uh, as well as a husband, and cheats with her lover during her own sex strike. Very Parisian take on the emancipated <laughs> modern woman. And this was a take on the emancipated modern woman, too. There was a very hostile element to these productions. These Parisian productions occasionally went on the road to other urban centers, including Athens. But Greece, uh, in Greece, they did not reflect or support the idea of female emancipation, um, but stimulated a reaction to it. In fact, were enlisted as part of the reaction to it. An interesting local adaptation that began around 1900 and lasted until the Second World War. <clears throat> 
straight-laced Athenians were offended by the licentiousness of the French shows and also by their inclusion of female performers and audiences. In Athens, this was a sign of Western decadence and effeminacy. Uh, and this is a sore point for traditional Greek men, since the Greek feminist and emancipation movements that began in the 1870s were gaining traction, and many emancipated Greek women had begun to be educated abroad, especially in France. And so these movements could be targeted as foreign-inspired. Where elsewhere, Lysistrata was being revived as a proto-feminist icon in support of women's emancipation, or at least as a way of discussing it, as in France, in Athens, it was enlisted to ridicule the idea and assert a di a traditional demotic values, while in the process creating new interest in Aristophanes. Like the French productions, the Greek shows were adaptations performed by touring cabarets, which lavished set sets and costumes, improvisation, music, dance, parody, impersonation of famous actresses. Um, Lysistrata was adapted to maximize and elaborate the sexual aspects and ancient satirical references were updated. But unlike the French productions, these were semi-pornographic, more obscene than the original, um, were all male casts, and women were forbidden to attend. Um, these, were, these were productions that catered to middle and lower class men. Uh, they were transvestite shows. They were a big hit, and before long, all transvestite performers had added Lysistrata to their repertory of roles and uh, quite a misogynistic uh, view of Lysistrata. There was no real attempt at historical accuracy. The play was adapted to the taste of its audience, mainly looking for titillation, as well as to their sexual politics, antagonism toward women generally, criticism of the women's movement, which was always depicted as a failure, and ridicule of effeminate men, especially Westerners like the French or Eastern Greeks. Even the theme of war, when it was included, was turned around. Uh, for example, in an adaptation for the International Panathenaea of 1915, an annual review, the women are negatively portrayed merely as teasing and taunting the men fighting the war. In other words, they're caricatured as, as uh, not supporting the war effort. Through these drag show Lysistratas, Aristophanes, hitherto a preserve of the educated elite, and its Western ideal of the classical past was popularized and claimed as a voice of native peasant culture, literally in its voice, since this Aristophanes was rendered in demotic Greek, not the high culture Greek used for tragedy, which did not appear in demotic translation until much later and only after a big cultural fight. Thus was native satirical drama reinvigorated and given a classical but not elite pedigree. Um, positioned as a counterbalance to Western influences. The official reaction was mixed, though popular conservatism was respected. Did this sort of vulgarity and obscenity threaten the morality of the lower orders? Did it demean a cultural classic, i.e. Aristophanes, uh, Lysistrata? Was it merely an excuse for lewdness or some kind of true expression of Greek culture? <clears throat> An example of one of these transvestite shows is a 1933 adaptation that had men desert their wives and refuse sex because their wives have become modern and spend more time away from home. Lysistrata and her friends are deliberating how to respond when Othello arrives. <laughs> he has strangled Desdemona and wants, and wants a new wife. <laughs> He propositions Lysistrata, but at the same time, he doesn't want to be a strike breaker. Lysistrata, because he's a man after all, um, Lysistrata falls in love with him, but the other women are jealous. They all crave sex and want to negotiate with the men immediately. Then they find out that the men don't miss their wives. After all, the strike isn't working because Socrates has, quote, taught them a novel lesson. In other words, he's taught them to do without women. This, by the way, was, this, um, provoked some particular outrage because Socrates was being confirmed as a culture icon of the Greeks, and they didn't like this presentation. In any case, um, in the end, the, sides, uh, the, the wives have to decide what to do about this strike. So they do what the government typically, typically does. They replace strikers with soldiers and sailors. 
So the husbands quickly give up the strike, not so much because they desire their wives, but they don't want to be cuckolded. So this is certainly not the Lysistrata we know and love, but it's an interesting kind of thing, especially by putting Othello in there, um, the paradigm of the cuckolded husband, who's not really been cuckolded. The satirical thrust is clear enough. Women are portrayed as having the upper hand over weak, effeminate men. If the threat to withhold sex is only bargaining power husbands held in the face of women's liberation, then it will fail, since women could feel free simply to disregard their marriage vows. In antiquity, the fantasy had been women becoming men. Now it was more like men becoming women was the big fear. That this was a transvestite production provided an allowable mode for the expression of this kind of satire. As in its own way, Mutatis Mutandis, the original production of 411 must have done with having women in, in, in the role of political spokespeople. Alongside the transvestite reviews were a few straightforward translations or adaptations into the vernacular for more legitimate theaters with minimal pruning or bodilarization and the infusion of topical satire. But in the uh, area of, the, of gender wars, these productions followed the conservative line of the reviews, and thus women were generally excluded or allowed only to see sanitized versions of the less body plays, never Lysistrata. And it must be said that throughout history, a lot of times it was true that these revivals were not seen by women. Lysistrata also made her British debut in the late 19th century, but by a different and more circuitous route. In the UK, Aristophanes had generally been less visible outside universities, where an all-male academic culture, aversion to transvestite acting, and the gentlemanly avoidance of obscene or political material combined to sidelight this particular play. In 1870, W.S. Gilbert, the English Aristophanes, produced The Princess, an adaptation of Tennyson's poem about maidens who shun men. The princess has decided to lead a celibate life and to promote women's rights and independence by founding a ladies' university. Her fiancé and his friends disguise themselves as female students and enroll in the university. To avoid gender war, the princess eventually capitulates. This is the play that Gilbert rewrote as an operetta in partnership with Arthur Sullivan as Princess Ida in 1883. Meanwhile, Benjamin Bickley Rogers had published his celebrated translation of Lysistrata, entitled The Revolt of the Women in 1878, following on performances of his other translations of Aristophanes in the 1870s, the first English language performances in the UK. Uh, beginning with frogs, uh, which changed the conversation from licentiousness to social utility. One more ingredient um, for Princess Ida and for a kind of merry Aristophanes came from Germany, another country where Aristophanes had been more an academic than a popular property. And this is an opera by Schubert called Die Verschworenen, The Conspirators, Schubert's sixth and final effort in Singspiel. It was written in 1823, but never publicly performed privately. Uh, it was never publicly performed, only privately during Schubert's lifetime. The action is set during the Crusades, when troops commanded by Baron Herbert von Ludenstein are deterred from continuous war making by their wives, led by the Baroness Ludmilla. In the bourgeois Biedermeier era, when Schubert lived, an emancipatory message would hardly have gone over well. In the opera, the women are outwitted, admit their failure, and agree to join their husbands in the wars. But before everybody goes to war, the husbands admit that they have been conquered by love, lay down their arm, vo arms voluntarily, and everybody dances around the maypole. The Baron advises the women to be well-behaved in the future and to leave the fighting to the men, and the women agree. Even so, the first public staging in, 19, in, in 1861, uh, under the less inflammatory title Der Häusliche Krieg, the domestic war, um, was well received. Um, but um, all the stuff about uh, war was, subs uh, was uh, subordinated to the, um, to the marriage theme. This was among the trove of Schubert scores collected and uh, indeed rescued from oblivion by Arthur Sullivan on his trip to Vienna in 1867. And it really was uh, very useful for uh, Lysistrata to be legitimized in Britain. 
Um, even the, the tame Princess Ida. And this was uh, followed in 1910 um, by the first production of a play by Aristophanes unambiguously to militate for social change. And this is uh, Lawrence Hausman's paraphrase of Lysistrata. Lawrence was the brother of the poet and classical scholar A. E. Hausman um, and a militant. He'd founded the Men's League for Women's Suffrage in, eight, in 1907, which organized demonstrations, civil disobedience, and hunger strikes. He had written a feminist play, Pains and Penalties, about the forced divorce of Queen Carolyn in 1820 that had been banned. So Lysistrata, he thought, uh, might avoid being banned because it was now uh, known to the public and uh, it was, had a classical imprimatur. Uh, so he did a version which toured in suffragette circles and was printed by the women's press in 1911 and was thus taken up by similar groups in North America. Uh, in North America, in America, women uh, gained the right to vote in 1920. Uh, <clears throat> not so long ago. Uh, so this was about the time when Americans, American women were fighting hard for the vote. <clears throat> it was important in that women were beginning to appropriate the play for themselves for the first time. <clears throat> and it stimulated university women to discover Aristophanes too. Uh, this happened typically in, in women-only schools and in translation since few women knew Greek. Lysistrata was a rare classical expression of feminist ideas that now, for the first time in history, were conceivable not only as a fantasy but as a reality. Other 20th century productions emphasized the anti-war aspects of the play, <clears throat> like Evan McCall's free adaptation in 1947 called Operation Olive Branch. He was a left-wing playwright, a committed communist, and the co-founder of the highly influential British company Theatre Workshop whose aim was to create a people's theater that would galvanize the interests of the working class. Operation Olive Branch took shape in 1938 as a version of Lysistrata responding to the Spanish Civil War, which was the signature leftist cause, <clears throat> and was revised and renamed as a more general anti-war and anti-capitalist statement that became part of the company's touring repertoire. In Greece, Lysistrata remained vulgar and misogynistic until after the war into the mid-1950s when Alexis Solomos began to produce cleaned up and civilized versions for the National Theater and the newly created summer festivals in Athens and Epidaurus. For a few years, Aristophanes became almost respectable until...